All right. Hello, everyone. Great to be with you. I'm Steve Kobus, and this talk is called Life of a Pixel. And it's about this thing that we call rendering. This is my seventh time giving this talk. It's been given at Google at internal events before. And every year it kind of gets dusted off and polished up. And uh, my vision for the talk was sort of born of a feeling of frustration because when I first started working in the Chrome C++ code base, I got pretty lost in all of the moving parts. And you know, this function calls this class, which calls this interface that's implemented by something else. But like, where's the code that actually puts the pixels on the screen? It's actually pretty hard to find that out just by tracing through it. And uh, at the time, there wasn't a lot of documentation that explained how everything fit together. So what I want to do in this talk is present the entire rendering pipeline to you in 45 minutes, I'll show you what each step looks like and why it's there. I'll warn you in advance, some of these slides look pretty dense because they have a lot of pointers to actual code and class names in the code base. And I did this on purpose uh, because I think it helps make the concepts more concrete and it makes the slides uh, more useful as a future reference. But don't worry about like trying to memorize every box on every slide. Not all the details are that important. Uh, and the code pointers are mainly there to give you a crisper, more vivid impression of the high level concept being presented. And you can always come back to the slides later. The link is here on the left, uh, bit.ly slash life of a pixel. And if you have questions as we go through this stuff, uh, we have a place to ask them on slido.com. You can follow the instructions at the top of the live stream or uh, use the Q&A link in the schedule. And at the end, I'll uh, take a look at the questions you've submitted and try to answer some of them. One of the challenges of a talk like this is that the architecture is constantly changing. So just be aware that I'm focusing on the current state of the code that's shipping today in Chrome's Canary channel with the default flags on the dominant platforms, which are Android, Windows, Mac, Chrome OS. And in many areas, there are efforts planned or partly built or partly rolled out that change the picture. Uh, I'll mention some of those in passing, but I'm not going to talk too much about the history or the future directions. The focus is on you know, the current state of the world. So this talk is about rendering, which is the process of turning content into pixels. I'll talk a little bit about content, what we mean by that, then I'll talk a little bit about pixels, and then we'll dive into the magic in the middle. From a Chrome uh, browser architecture perspective, content means everything in that red box where the content of the page appears. Outside of content is browser UI elements like the tab strip, the address bar, the navigation buttons, the menus, the bookmarks, extensions, that little pop-up that tells you your network is, connection is secure. All of that stuff is outside of content. In Chrome, the content area is represented by a class called web contents, which is the primary public interface that the content namespace exposes to the embedder. A key part of Chrome's security model, which Chrome pioneered back in the day, is that rendering happens inside a sandboxed process. So an evil website might exploit a vulnerability in the rendering code, but the sandbox keeps the damage contained, so the browser itself is safe and the other tabs are safe. So web contents encapsulates creating and managing renderer processes, and uh, most of the things that we're going to talk about today happen inside the renderer process. Uh, you've probably heard of Blink. We call Blink the rendering engine, although it's really a subset of the code in the renderer underneath the content layer. And the lines around what's in Blink code versus what's outside of Blink code have some historical baggage and are evolving over time. But essentially, you can think of Blink as the place where we implement the semantics of the web platform APIs and all the concepts and logic that are defined in the web specs. And finally, next to Blink, there's that mysterious thing called CC, which stands for Chromium Compositor. And if you're like, what's a compositor? Don't worry about that for now. I will tell you all about it later on. So this is what content looks like as a browser UI component. From a rendering perspective, content is a generic term for all of the code and assets inside a web page or the front end of a web application. So that includes HTML, which is text, markup surrounding the text, like paragraph tags in the example, it includes CSS or style, which, like this uh, style rule that selects all the paragraph elements and assigns the color of the value of red to the color property. Uh, so that tells the engine to render all the paragraphs with red text. Then there's JavaScript. And pretty much everything about the state of the rendering can be modified on the fly by JavaScript. So you can change the text, put new markup in, change style values on specific elements 
elements, change style rules, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And of course, you have external resources like images that can be embedded in the HTML. So those are the basic building blocks of a website. Of course, there are many other kinds of content that are rendered in special ways. But in this talk, I'll focus on how we render the very basic sort of nuts and bolts of the web. I just want to emphasize that a real web page is just thousands of lines of HTML, CSS, JavaScript delivered in plain text over the network. Web pages don't have any uh, don't require any compilation or packaging like you might find on more traditional application platforms. That means the source code for the web app is literally the input to the browser's rendering pipeline. And this simplicity was key to the success of the web in the early days, because you can just write some markup in a text editor and boom, you have a web page. But it means the rendering engine has to start with the HTML. At the other end of the pipeline, Chrome has to put pixels on the screen using the graphics libraries provided by the underlying operating system. On most platforms today, that's a standardized API called OpenGL. On Windows, there's an extra translation to DirectX. In the future, we may support newer APIs, such as Vulkan, which is the replacement for OpenGL. And these libraries provide very low-level graphics primitives and let you say things like draw this polygon at these coordinates into this buffer of virtual pixels. Obviously, they don't understand anything about the web or HTML or CSS. When I was preparing this talk, my philosophy was uh, we're not done until we hit the OS. So I actually like made a test page with a div, and I traced the code in Chrome from the HTML coming off the network all the way down to the raw OpenGL calls. OK, so I've explained what we're starting with and where we're trying to go. That is, the overall goal of rendering is to turn HTML, CSS, and JavaScript into the right GL calls to display the pixels on the screen. But as we go through the rest of the talk, let's keep in mind a second goal, which is that we want the right intermediate data structures to update the rendering efficiently after it's produced and answer queries about it from script or other parts of the system. So what I'm going to describe is a pipeline or a life cycle. And it's broken into a bunch of stages with their own inputs and outputs. So we turn content into something else, then turn that thing into another thing, and so on. And that's partly because rendering is too complicated to express as a single operation, but also because those intermediate data structures let us update the rendering more efficiently later on, because maybe we don't need to run all those stages for every update. And once we finish describing the first version of our pipeline, I'm going to come back to this notion of updating the rendering and introduce some new concepts that help us optimize it. So let's jump into the first stage. We're in Blink code now in the renderer process. And the first resource that comes down from the network connection is typically HTML. The other resource types, like CSS, JavaScript, images, are either embedded in the HTML or brought in as secondary resources. So our starting point for rendering is the HTML parser, which receives this character stream of tags and text. <clears throat> HTML tags impose a semantically meaningful hierarchical structure on the document. For example, a div may contain two paragraphs. Each paragraph may contain some text. So the first step in rendering is to parse those tags to build an object model that reflects this structure with pointers connecting the objects. And we call this the document object model, or DOM for short. And the DOM is a tree of the variety found in computer science where the trees are upside down. And this is the first of many trees we'll encounter in the engine. And the reason they're all trees is that they're all based on the DOM, which is based on the structure of HTML. When we talk about nodes in Blink, we usually mean the nodes of the DOM tree. The DOM serves double duty as both the internal representation of the page for the browser and the API exposed to JavaScript for querying or modifying the rendering. So the V8 JavaScript engine exposes DOM web APIs like create element or append child uh, kind of as thin wrappers around the C++ DOM tree through a system called bindings. There can actually be multiple DOM trees in a single document. So HTML supports these things called custom elements. So you can build fancy uh, reusable widgets whose internal DOM is encapsulated in something called a shadow tree. And the shadow tree will have placeholders called slots where the embedder can inject some markup. <clears throat> 
This is mainly something you want to be aware of if you're doing any DOM traversals. So instead of all these separate trees in the same document, what you often want is a flat tree traversal, which gives you a composed view of the entire document as a single tree. But behind the scenes, the flat tree traversal is crossing between the host tree and the shadow tree in both directions because it descends from the host trees custom element into the shadow root, and it descends from a slot in the shadow DOM into that slot's assigned node in the host tree. And this is what we use for rendering since it corresponds to how the elements should actually be laid out. Now that we've built the DOM tree, it's time to look at the styles. And here we see a style rule. A rule is a selector, in this case it's P and a list of property values. The P is called a selector because it selects uh, or describes a particular set of DOM nodes that it should apply to, in this case, the two paragraph elements in our DOM. And style properties are the control knobs that web authors use to customize the rendering of DOM elements. There are right now a little over 700 properties supported by Chrome. There's a property for just about any rendering behavior you might imagine from changing formatting or colors or margins or positioning or backgrounds or fonts. There's even styles that control animation by causing an element to fade in or move around the screen. Often a style will influence the rendering of not just one element, but the entire DOM subtree below the element that it's applied to. For example, if you set a rotation transform on a node, you're rotating not just that node, but everything rendered by its descendants. Now, not only are there lots and lots of style properties, but it can be non-trivial to determine which elements a style rule actually applies to. Like this one at the top is every alternating paragraph inside any div without the class name foo. And some elements may be selected by more than one rule with conflicting declarations for a particular property. Like here we may have a we might have a paragraph element in our DOM that matches both of these selectors. And the style engine has to decide, is that paragraph going to be red or blue? So it applies rules from the CSS spec to uh, resolve conflicts. Like, oh, the blue rule comes after the red rule, but the red rule has bang important, so the red one wins. And so the style engine's job is to kind of sort all of that out. When we first encounter a style sheet, we parse the CSS text into an object model of the style rules, which has rich representations of the selectors and the property value mappings. And these style rule objects are indexed in various ways so that we can do efficient lookups. And the implementation here makes heavy use of generated code. So we have this JSON file that defines all the style properties declaratively. And the C++ classes that represent specific properties for the object model are auto-generated by Python scripts during the build. But when the parser is all done, we have an instance of style sheet contents for every style sheet that is active in the document. So active could mean that there's a style tag in the HTML, or it could be an external resource like a, a .css file that the HTML has asked us to bring in. There's even a, there's a special default style sheet built into Chrome so that every page gets seeded with some default style values for the native HTML elements, like uh, every body starts with an eight pixel margin. So now we have an object model with all our parsed style rules for all our active sheets. And we have to figure out how those styles actually apply to, your, to our specific DOM elements. Remember, these rules are selecting complicated overlapping sets of nodes with precedence semantics. But at the end of the day, we want to be able to ask for the like resolved or actual value of any given property for any given DOM element. Like, what's the top margin of this div, or what's the background color of the body? So style resolution walks the DOM tree and con consults the parsed rules uh, to produce a computed style for each element. And computed style is just a giant map of property to value. And it hangs off of the element and it says this element is red and italicized and has a two inch margin or whatever. And this is the output of the style engine. Chrome Developer Tools lets you play around with this because you can highlight an element, look for the tab that says computed, see a big list of style property value pairs, like the padding top of this image element is 109 pixels. And these values are mostly coming straight from the Blink computed style object. Although there's a small caveat here that 
DevTools shows some layout information on this tab as well. For example, if you have a plain old div with the default styles, then the style engine will say, oh, the resolved value of the width property is the token called auto. But DevTools won't tell you the width is auto. DevTools will show you the actual pixel width, like 800 px. So DevTools is actually mixing a little bit of layout information back into the computed style UI. Anyway, now we've built the DOM and computed all the styles. The next step is to determine the visual geometry of the elements. And you can think of each element as occupying one or more uh, rectangular boxes inside the content area. And the job of layout is to compute the coordinates of those boxes. In the simple case, layout places blocks one after another in DOM order, descending vertically. We call this block flow because the blocks flow down the page. The content inside a block is broken into lines. Individual runs of text and inline elements like a span generate boxes within the lines. So in Western languages, the inline boxes are flowing from left to right. But in languages like Arabic or Hebrew, they flow from right to left. To figure out where text runs start and end, uh, where to break a line of text onto the next line, we have to measure it using the font from the computed style. And Layout uses an open source library called HarfBuzz to select glyphs that correspond to the characters in the text and compute the size and position of each glyph, accounting for things like ligatures and kerning. Layout also computes multiple kinds of bounding rects for the single element. For example, if the insides of an element are larger than its declared border box, we have a situation called overflow. And layout has to keep track of both the border box rect and the overflow rect. An interesting thing about overflow is you can make it scrollable. So another side effect of layout is computing scroll boundaries, like your min and max scroll position, and reserving space for the scroll bars, deciding where they should go. Uh, the most common scrollable DOM node is actually the document itself, which is the root of the DOM tree. But CSS lets you make any element scrollable by setting the style property called overflow. We need more specialized layout algorithms for other things like table elements or multi-column or floating objects that sit to one side with content flowing around them or East Asian languages that have text running vertically instead of horizontally. And many of these require tracking a lot of global states. For example, the size of a table cell may depend on the contents of other cells that are very far away from it. So we have to consider the whole document and not just kind of lay out an element in isolation from the others. But in all cases, um, the DOM structure and computed style values are the inputs to the layout algorithm. So we can see that each pipeline stage is kind of using the results of the previous stages and producing outputs that influence future stages. Layout operates on a separate tree linked to the DOM. We call this the layout tree. The nodes in this tree implement the layout algorithms. And there's a bunch of layout classes like layout box, layout inline, layout table, etc. depending on what layout algorithm the element needs to use. But they all inherit from the common base class layout object. So every node in the layout tree is a layout object. But before we can do layout, we have to actually build this tree. So that happens at the end of the style resolution stage. Then the layout stage is just traversing that layout tree that we've already built, figuring out the geometry data, the line breaks, the scroll bars, all that other stuff. In simple cases, DOM nodes are one-to-one -one with layout objects. Uh, there are some notable exceptions. For example, if you set display none on a node, then it doesn't create a layout object. And sometimes you can even have a layout object that doesn't have a node. For example, if inline and block elements are siblings, we create an anonymous block to wrap the inline. That makes layout simpler because we know the children of a block are either all blocks or all inlines. You can even get two layout objects for the same node. That tends to happen if you put a block inside an inline. Finally, uh, if you recall, we talked about shadow DOM earlier, and we said we would use the flat tree traversal to render. So the layout tree is, is based on that flat traversal, which crosses into the shadow roots. And that means a layout object may even belong to a different DOM tree from its own layout container. <laughs> 
The layout engine is in the middle of a rewrite. So right now the tree is this mixture of uh, legacy layout objects that use the old engine and NG layout objects, which use the next generation engine. And we're gradually transitioning these old layout objects to NG as we build out its functionality to handle more kinds of layout. And the key change in NG is a cleaner separation of inputs and outputs. So in the old engine, we would store everything on the layout object, the inputs and the outputs, and we would ask it to update its layout, and it could see the state of the whole tree during the layout. For example, it might ask for the width of its parent in order to know how much space was available. But the parent hadn't actually finalized its own layout because it was in the middle of recursing into its children. So there was this kind of delicate dance where you had to be very careful to only look at the bits that had already been updated and not rely on the, st on the stale data by accident. With NG, we have separate objects for the, out, for the inputs, the algorithms, and the outputs. We wrap the layout object in an input node, and we supply a constraint space that is the space available for the algorithm to lay out in. And it produces a layout result. And the result is an immutable object, so we can store it in a cache keyed on the constraint space. So NG has some performance benefits from smarter caching, and this Separation of inputs and outputs makes it easier to reason about the algorithm and quicker to build new layout algorithms. The layout results are actually a new tree called the fragment tree. And each node in that tree describes the physical geometry of a rectangular fragment of the element. So a simple block element might produce just one fragment. But an element might produce multiple fragments if it's broken across lines or broken across columns or pages. Let's look at an example. Here's a little bit of HTML content. And uh, we can see it's, a, it's got a div that's uh, float left uh, with some padding, a couple of words in bold, and the last, mar last word with a negative margin offset. And here's what it looks like. So we got a few different interesting layout things going on. Here's the DOM tree for this content. We can see the structure reflecting the tag nesting. And we can see some of these nodes are HTML elements, and some of them are text nodes with the character strings. And here's the layout tree that's produced for that DOM tree. You can see mostly one-to-one -one layout objects with DOM nodes. I'll go back and forth here to compare. Uh, but they, they, we also see a, a new one second from the top. It says ng block flow anonymous. So that one didn't come from a DOM node. The engine just uh, threw it in to avoid mixing block and inline siblings. Now we haven't actually performed layout on this tree yet, and we haven't done line breaking yet. So we have a single layout text for quick brown, which we can predict is going to need two fragments because the word brown is flowing on to the next line. And finally, when the layout pass is done, we see the fragment tree, and it shows the results of line breaking with quick and brown are split up and fragments around each line called a line box. And we see, for example, that the word the is at a pixel offset of 24.9 by 18. You might say, how did we end up with such a weird fractional offset? Well, it's because we had to make space for the floating capital F, and we measured the letter F, and it was 8.9 pixels wide in this font, plus 16 for the padding. And then the box for jumps is at 80 by negative 6. So these boxes can kind of uh, spill out of each other in all directions. Now that we understand the geometry of our layout objects, it's time to paint them. Paint records a list of drawing instructions called paint ops. With paint ops, we are finally seeing something that sort of looks like a graphics API, although it's still relatively high level. A paint op might be something like draw a rectangle or draw a path, or draw an image, or draw a blob of text. And it would have parameters for the coordinates and the colors and so on. And these paint ops are wrapped up in things called display items that have pointers back to the layout objects. And the whole thing is wrapped up in a container called a paint artifact. So paint artifact is the output of the paint stage. But so far, uh, we're just building a recording of paint ops that can be played back later. So we're not actually executing these paint ops yet. And we'll see a little later why that's useful. It's important to paint elements in the right order so that they stack correctly when they overlap. So paint uses something called stacking order, which is a little different from DOM order, because it can be, it can be controlled by a style property called Z index. So in this example, the yellow box paints after the green box, even though it comes first in the DOM. 
It's even possible for an element to be partly in front of and partly behind another element. And that's because paint runs in multiple phases. And each paint phase does its own traversal of the subtree under a route that we call the stacking context. So the blue box paints after the green box uh, within each phase. But the background, pay, background phase paints all of the backgrounds before the foreground phase paints any of the text. Let's look at a paint example. So here's a single div with the word pixels, and it's got some styles. And here's what it looks like. Now, when we paint this document, we get four paint ops in three display items. The first is just filling the document background with white. Then we have a display item for the box decoration on that div, and it draws a rect that's filled with gray and another rect that's stroked with purple for the border. Finally, we have a display item for the foreground phase, and it has just one paint op that draws a text blob. And inside that paint op, we see it's got the starting coordinates, and it wants to use the color black. And the blob has the glyph identifiers and X offsets for each individual glyph in the font that was selected to render those characters. If you recall in the layout, I briefly mentioned text shaping. So this data is basically copied over from that shape result that we got from HarfBuzz, which handled the kerning and ligatures and stuff like that. So we built some paint ops, but we haven't executed them yet. The paint ops in the paint artifact are executed by a process we call rasterization. Raster turns some or all of the paint ops into a bitmap, which is like a matrix of color values in memory. So each cell has bits that encode the color and transparency of a single pixel. And raster also includes decoding any image resources that are embedded in the page. So the image will come off the network in a format like JPEG or PNG, and the paint op will just reference the compressed data. So raster has to invoke the appropriate decoder to decompress the image into a raw bitmap. We said the bitmaps from raster are in memory. Usually it's GPU memory referenced by a texture identifier uh, in OpenGL. In the past, we would first raster to main memory and then upload that to the GPU. But modern GPUs can actually run shaders to produce pixels directly on the GPU. So this mode is called hardware accelerated rasterization. But in either case, the result of raster is that we have a bitmap of pixels in some kind of memory. Maybe it's CPU memory or GPU memory. But we're still not seeing those pixels on the screen just yet. Raster uses an open source library called Skia that we maintain and ship in the Chrome binary. But it lives in a separate code repository. And it's also used by a few other projects, including the Android OS. Skia provides a layer of abstraction around the hardware. And it implements things like paths and Bezier curves and subpixel anti-aliasing and blend modes. So when it's time to raster our paint artifact, those paint ops are making calls to an SK canvas object. And that goes through some more abstractions inside Skia. The accelerated raster path actually builds another buffer of drawing operations, which is flushed at the end of the raster task. But during that flush, the Skia backend will issue the GL commands that actually build the texture. There's a complication for raster. So because of the security sandbox, we cannot make system calls directly from the renderer process. So instead of rastering in the renderer, we send the stream of paint ops over IPC into a special process called the GPU process. And that's where we run the SCIA code that issues the real GL calls. This process isolation actually helps us in two different ways. Uh, the renderer sandbox, of course, protects us from malicious websites. We don't want them to be able to talk directly to the GPU. But we also want to be protected from graphics drivers that are unstable or insecure. And uh, isolating GL here means that like, if the GPU process crashes, Chrome can just start it back up again, and you probably didn't even notice. The paint ops are wrapped up in a structure called a command buffer to transport them across the process boundary. Command buffers are actually a very flexible mechanism. They were originally built for serialized uh, open GL commands. So you could issue like actual GL API calls and have them sort of transparently proxied across the process. Uh, but raster today, what we call sort of uh, what we call out of process raster uh, uses command buffers just as a wrapper for the paint ops, uh, which means that the command buffer is agnostic to the underlying graphics API. So when we 
have uh, when Vulkan is supported. Vulkan is the replacement for OpenGL, and in the future, Skia will use Vulkan instead. And but the paint ops and all the stuff above Skia uh, kind of doesn't have to worry about that. Skia issues GL through a table of function pointers, and on most platforms, we set those up with dynamic lookup from the system's uh, shared OpenGL library. Uh, on Windows, there's a translation step. So those GL pointers are uh, coming from a library that we provide called Angle, represented by the red box that's at an angle. Angle's job is to translate OpenGL to DirectX, uh, which is Microsoft's API for accelerated graphics on Windows. And we found that it works better than the Windows OpenGL drivers. Let's review. We've now gone all the way from content through DOM, style, layout, paint, raster, and GPU to pixels in memory. But it's about to get more complicated. To motivate this, first remember that the rendering is not static. So we're not just rendering once and we're done. There are all kinds of things happening during the browsing session that can change the rendering dynamically. And running the full pipeline is expensive, so we want to avoid unnecessary work as much as possible. To think about change over time, we have this concept of animation frames. So each frame is a complete rendering of the state of the content at a particular point in time. And when we want smooth motion, like for scrolling, zooming, or CSS animations of page elements, we often aim for 60 frames per second, which is the V-Sync or refresh interval on typical display hardware. Some of the newer devices can even do higher than that, like 90 or 120. But at 60, that means if we take more than 1 60th of a second to render the frame, the motion will stutter and look janky. One obvious optimization is to keep track of what's changed and reuse things that haven't changed. So each pipeline stage uh, has its own concept of granular invalidation, where you can say, for example, this node needs its layout, layout recomputed in the next frame. And then the next pass will look only at the nodes that have been marked as needing layout. But that only gets you so far, especially if you're transforming a large visual region, which is common for animations and scrolling. So for example, if we had to rerun paint and raster for the entire region after every scroll event, that would be really expensive. Another thing to keep in mind is that everything on the main thread competes with JavaScript. So even if your rendering pipeline is super fast, you'll still get jank if script is doing something expensive before the rendering even has a chance to start. This sets the stage for an optimization that we call compositing. The compositor introduces two fundamental ideas, break the page into layers and combine them on a separate thread. So a layer is a piece of the web page that can be transformed and rastered independently of the other layers. In traditional animation, like old TV cartoons, you would draw the background once, then you would draw your character on transparent paper so that you could move it across the background without, ha without having to draw every frame from scratch. That's essentially what layers are. Uh, Chrome developer tools can show you this 3D view of the layers. That's kind of cool. And on this slide, you can see that we're building the layers on the main thread, but we're sending them off to another thread called Impel. The name doesn't make much sense. There are obscure historical reasons that it's called that, but it's in all the class names, so it's a good thing to remember. Impel means compositor thread. The orange border here shows that we've created a layer for a DOM element so we can animate it efficiently. So instead of redoing raster on every animation frame, we raster the layer once, and we can move that bitmap around on the GPU. If a container has a layer, its children become part of that layer. So you can think of a layer as capturing a subtree of content for independent raster. It turns out that all the important cases of fluid motion of part of the page can be expressed in terms of composited layers. We have layers transformed by animation or scrolling or pinch zoom. Scroll containers can clip a layer of scrolling content so that it's only visible within a certain region. So it's very flexible, and this means the compositor thread has everything it needs to handle scroll input events while the main thread is busy with other things like JavaScript. So the browser process gets input from the operating system saying, oh, the user has moved their finger on the touch screen. And uh, it forwards that to the renderer, where the compositor thread gets the first crack at handling it. And if it's just scrolling a composited layer, we can do that without even talking to the main thread. 
But in some cases, the compositor might say, nope, sorry, I can't handle that input. Like maybe you scrolled an element that doesn't have a layer, or maybe you have blocking JavaScript event listeners. Then the compositor has to forward that input to the main thread, and it goes into the main thread's task queue, and it gets around to it whenever it's freed up. Composited layers are represented by CC layer. CC stands for Chromium Compositor. Today, the layers are created from the layout tree by promoting things with certain style properties like animation or transform. And we have this intermediate step called the paint layer tree. Paint layers are like candidates for layer promotion. So some layout objects will get paint layers and some paint layers will get CC layers. And the CC layers don't have any parent-child relationships, so they're just a flat list from back to front and not really a tree. But we still call it a layer tree all over the code because it used to be a tree and we haven't made all the names consistent. Elements that are scroll containers actually create a whole set of special layers for things like the borders, the scrolling contents, and the scroll bars. These are all managed by a class called composited layer mapping. There's an interesting problem with composited scrolling. So your display has red, green, blue channels for a single pixel sort of um, spatially uh, separated. So they're laid out next to each other. And we can take advantage of that to make the letters look sharper when we blend edge pixels against the background. But that only works if we know the background color when we're rasterizing the text. And scrollers have transparent backgrounds by default. So if you're transparent and composited, we cannot do subpixel anti-aliasing because the text doesn't know what's going to be behind it. We can only do grayscale anti-aliasing, which varies the transparency channel, but ignores the subpixels. So we take this into account when we decide whether to composite. The good news is that displays with higher pixel densities are a lot more common now. And on a high density display, we don't really need subpixel. So the trend is toward compositing more scrollers. In fact, on Android and Chrome OS, we already composite all the scrollers. Building the layer tree is a separate lifecycle stage called compositing assignments. Today, this happens after layout and before paint on the main thread. And each layer is painted separately. So a layer will have its own display item list with all the paint ops that were produced when that layer was painted. When the compositor draws a layer, it can apply various properties, like a transformation matrix, a clip, a scroll offset, opacity, reflection effects. This data is stored in property trees. You can think of these as properties of a layer. In fact, they used to be stored inside the layer. But we have decoupled properties from layers uh, in order to make the compositing architecture more flexible. So in theory, the compositor could apply these properties to any sequence of paint ops, even if it didn't have a layer, uh, although we're not quite at the point of doing that. In the same way that the compositing assignment stage builds the layer tree, we have a stage called pre-paint that builds the property trees. In the future, we're going to create layers after paint instead of before paint. This is a project called Composite After Paint. And the goal of CAP is to make us let us make more flexible and fine-grained compositing decisions. You can see that CAP requires the decoupling of properties from layers because paint uh, needs to know the paint properties, um, but it's not going to know anything about the layers because we haven't made the layers yet. Now, remember, we still need to get this data over to the compositor thread to actually assemble them into a single output. So after paint is finished, we run something called the commit, which updates copies of the layered layer list and the property trees on the compositor thread to match the state on the main thread. And main will ask impl to run the commit, and main will block until it's done so that it's safe to kind of read the main thread data structures. So let's revisit what raster looks like now that we have compositing. Remember that laster, layers raster independently. Uh, layers can also be really big. So for a scroll container, we have a layer for the entire scrolling content, even though only a small piece of it might actually be visible. So if we rastered the whole layer, that's a lot of unnecessary work. <laughs> 
So the compositor divides the layer into tiles. Tiles are the unit of raster work. They're created on the compositor thread by the tile manager, and they're scheduled in raster tasks that run on a pool of dedicated worker threads. And the tasks are prioritized by whether the tile is in or near the viewport. So the ones that are visible, of course, we need to raster those right away. Um, and if you're scrolling, then the ones that like might be visible soon are rastered before the ones that are farther away. We also have tiles for different zoom levels. So if you're zooming in, we need to show a higher resolution tile. Once all the tiles are rastered, the compositor thread generates draw quads. A quad is like an instruction to draw a tile in a particular location on the screen, taking into account all the transformations and effects and things applied to the layer by the property trees. Each quad references the tile's rastered output in memory, and the quads are wrapped up in a compositor frame object, which gets submitted from the renderer to the GPU process, which we'll get to in a minute. So we've now reached the output of the renderer. These are the animation frames that are produced by the renderer process. We saw that raster and drawing both happen on the compositor threads layers after the commit, but we also saw that raster happens asynchronously on a pool of worker threads. So this creates a bit of a complication when a new commit comes in, because we'd like to continue drawing tiles from the previous commit while we're waiting for the new commit to be rastered. We solve this by having two copies of the layers. So the pending tree receives the commit, and when it's ready to draw, we have a step called activation, which copies the pending tree into the active tree. And the terminology is a little weird, so when it says tree, remember that's actually layer list and property trees kind of bundled together, but we call it the pending and active trees. OK, so now we understand how complete animation frames are produced by the renderer and submitted to the GPU process. Now, there's only one GPU process, but there may be multiple renderers submitting frames. So in HTML, you can use an iframe element to embed a document from another origin, like a.com embeds b.com. And for security, these sites will be uh, isolated, which means they get separate renderer processes, but their output still has to be stitched together. And we also have the browser process with its own compositor generating animation frames for the browser UI, like uh, the tab strip and the address bar, all those things that are outside of the content area. So all these surfaces submit their frames to a thing in the GPU process called the display compositor, which runs on the viz thread, that's V-I-Z for visuals, and it synchronizes these frames as they're coming in, and it understands the dependencies where you have one surface uh, embedded inside another. So Viz has aggregated all these frames, and Viz also issues the graphics calls that ultimately display the quads from the compositor frame on the screen. And the output of Viz is double buffered, so it draws those quads into a back buffer. And its OpenGL calls are proxied from the Viz thread to the GPU main thread over command buffers. We saw command buffers earlier used for raster. Now we're seeing them again for display. But on this slide, we're using the command buffer to send serialized uh, OpenGL calls over the thread boundary. And the real GL calls are issued by the decoder uh, on the GPU main thread. There's also a newer mode, uh, which is currently launched on some platforms, but not all of them, where instead of sending GL calls, Viz uses the Skia library, which we also saw back in Raster. And it builds this data structure called a deferred display list and passes that to the GPU thread. So now the, the Viz code and the transport format are sort of API agnostic. They're not tied to OpenGL. And at the very bottom, we can play back that deferred display list through the Skia backend for OpenGL or the Skia backend for Vulkan. So we've drawn the quads into that back buffer, and the very last step for Viz is to issue a, issue a command to swap the buffers so that the back buffer is now the front buffer. And finally, our pixels are on the screen where the user can see them. Of course, there could still be more compositing happening in, inside the OS window manager or things like that, but at least we have now handed off responsibility for these pixels to the underlying platform below Chrome.
So let's recap. We took web content, built a DOM tree, resolved styles, updated layout, assigned compositing layers, generated property trees, painted the layers, committed the layers with the paint ops and the property trees to the compositor thread, broke the layers into tiles, rastered the tiles using Skia, copied the pending tree to the active tree, generated draw quads, submitted the quads to Viz, and displayed them as pixels on the screen. Most of the pipeline runs in the renderer, but raster and display run in the GPU process. The core rendering stages, DOM, st DOM style layout paint are in blink code on the main thread, but input events for scrolling and zooming can update layers on the compositor thread while the main thread is busy. Congratulations, we've reached the end of life of a pixel. Our pixel is now dead. So remember, uh, if you have questions, you can go to Slido uh, and write them there using the code at the top of the live stream. Uh, I know we covered a lot here. It's OK if you didn't follow all the details. We know that rendering is huge and complicated, probably more complicated than necessary. The good news is that a lot of the refactorings that are underway, like Layout NG and Composite After Paint, even though they're adding complexity in the short term, are at least aiming towards an end state that is simpler and easier to understand. So things are getting better, but I think that the Chromium project needs to continue to prioritize and invest in simplifying the system and paying down our technical debt and kind of explaining and documenting the complexity for folks who are coming into the code base and trying to figure out what's going on. Anyway, the link to the slides is bit.ly slash life of a pixel. And if you have feedback about the talk or if there's anything I got wrong, please email me since we're always looking at ways to improve it. And uh, now we'll take a look at the Slido and um, see what questions you guys have. With such a complex system, how to debug if there is an unexpected result? Yeah, uh, it's pretty hard. Um, I've recently discovered a really cool debugger called RR, uh, which uh, uh, the, the the key concept there is that you can actually you can record uh, a session and then step back in GDB and uh, it has a replay feature so you you can kind of uh, debug but also go back in time. Uh, what's your favorite complication that you didn't mention? Hmm. That's a tough one. Uh, so I used to work on uh, scrolling, and there's a lot of there's a lot of deep complexity in scrolling, and uh, for example. There's a huge amount of um, uh, a, a huge amount of complexity that just goes into like painting scroll bars on different platforms. Like on Mac OS, we have to use native uh, OS APIs for drawing the scroll bars, and there's a lot of uh, plumbing that kind of goes into making that work correctly with the compositor when the scroll bars are in their own layers. And um, so there's a lot of uh, deep stuff in, in scrolling that I I, uh, I mentioned in a previous talk on scrolling that I didn't have time to talk about today. Does paint take into account the layers from compositing? If so, how will this affect performance if compositing is done after paint? Yeah, so originally, or I guess in the current architecture, uh, we ask a layer to paint itself, and we get a separate uh, list of paint ops for each layer. But in the new architecture, we'll just get one list of paint ops for the entire uh, document. And, uh, but we'll have enough information in those paint ops to make decisions after paint about where it's a good idea to have a layer because the paint ops will also be annotated with uh, like chunks which say that this sequence of paint ops is sharing the same properties and then here is the start and end of a new like property value and then we can say like well maybe those should be a layer where is there room for improvement and how much room is there i think there's a lot of room for improvement because this uh, a lot of this complexity is kind of um, accumulated uh, slowly over time where each step along the way kind of made sense, but then the whole picture doesn't necessarily match what we would build if we were starting out from scratch. So I think there there's definitely room to, to simplify um, the layout architecture and the paint architecture, and we have projects underway to do that. Um, I think there's also room for uh, better tooling to help uh, both browser engineers and web developers kind of understand their performance bottlenecks. And I know that that's something that um, the DevTools team spends a lot of time on. Do we have any other questions? All right. I think that is it. So uh, we will uh, call it there. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And uh, enjoy the rest of the event. <laughs>